brothers and sisters, uh, this morning you could actually you could actually write this right. Because when you have a text like this, it probably could fall into that category of sermons that you have heard again and again and again. You read through these words from 1 Corinthians, and they are some of the most beautiful, some of the most poetic that we come across in all of our culture. It's not surprising that these words from 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, are often requested either as a text or at least a reading for young couples getting married. This description of love, this imagery, is the kind of stuff that we, we want to see first off of reading cards that we give to, that we share with our loved ones. But there's a, a bit of a, a challenge, a little bit of a conflict, because these words serve a dual purpose. Not only do they show us an ideal of what love looks like, but they also show us what a far cry from that ideal love our love actually is. In that regard, it, it's kind of like the, the comparison photos that you've seen uh, where there's the Pinterest, the frame-worthy picture of some project that just looks beautiful, and then right next to it you have the reality picture, the one that is cringe-worthy, one that you wouldn't frame, the, the real actual, the real life attempt at making that project. And the one picture of love in 1 Corinthians 13 is beautiful. You would want everybody to see it. You wouldn't be embarrassed by it in the least. But the reality of it, quite frankly, looks like something that your toddler tried to put together. No offense to toddlers this morning. But that is the reality of how far our love falls from this description of what Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So we come across these verses. And I say you can write the sermon because here is the description of what our love looks or should look like. We recognize, confess that our love doesn't look like that. We are thankful that God loves us enough to forgive us. So let's move on. And then the next time we hear a sermon, Repeat. Here's what love should look like. I confess mine doesn't look like that. And repeat. But what changes from one love sermon to the next? If anything. Does anything change or is it just a matter of you can write the sermon yourself because you've heard it before? You, you don't hide the fact. You don't pretend that you don't know that this is not a description of your love. But nothing really changes. So maybe we start this morning by looking at the latter part of Paul's words, and we ask ourselves, if we want to relate to this section the way that Paul encourages us to. We acknowledge in verse 11, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. So are you going to be content to continue to carry on like a child and be content with simply acknowledging, well, I know I should love that way, I don't, but I have no intention of, of changing. Nothing is going to be any different the next time that we talk about love. Or, or are you willing, like Paul, to say, wait a minute, if I'm going to be mature in my faith, if I'm going to grow up in my faith, that means that change happens from one love sermon to the next. And assuming you want that to be the case, then let's appreciate the magnitude, how, how significant God has a, a high view of, of love. And to do that, you, you might appreciate reviewing the chapter that precedes this one at some point this week. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That is the, the section where Paul touches on one of the most popular topics that, that Christians are enamored with, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's where he lists all of the cool gifts that the believers in the early church got. They were able to perform miracles. They were able to heal people. They could speak in tongues. They could prophesy. All of these awesome gifts, right? And that's all of 1 Corinthians 12. And Paul says everybody's got these gifts and they all serve the same purpose, building up the body of Christ. And then... You know what he says at the end of that chapter? He's talking about all these awesome spiritual gifts. He says this in verse 30. 31. But eagerly desire the greater gifts. 
And now I will show you the most excellent way. Wait a minute. I mean, as awesome as all those gifts were that Paul was just talking about, all of those spiritual gifts, he wraps up that section by saying there's something even greater and that you should eagerly desire something else even more than those. That must be a pretty big deal. Let's listen to what Paul has to say. Now, if you're familiar with Paul, if you've read anything else by Paul in the New Testament, you know that one of his very common themes is the theme of faith. And so you would be reasonable to presume that as Paul is segueing from all these awesome spiritual gifts, he says, but there's something even greater to desire or to pursue. Oh, here we go. Paul's going to talk about his favorite topic, faith. Because Paul talks about righteousness by faith, being saved by faith, not works, but faith. So you wouldn't be shocked to see that that's what he must be alluding to. And indeed, as you look into chapter 13, as you heard it read, Paul does refer to faith in that section, but maybe not the way that you would have anticipated or expected. Look what he says about faith in verse 2. He says, if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Is that a typo? Paul, the, the fanboy of faith in Scripture, the one who elevates it to this highest noble pursuit, is saying that even if you have a mountain-moving faith but don't have love, you're nothing. And that's not all. To look at the end of this chapter, in chapter 13, the very last verse, Paul says that love doesn't just trump faith. He says, and now these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So not only does, does love count more than all of these spiritual gifts, awesome as they might be, but it also tops even faith and hope, according to Paul. You know what that means? If Paul is unclear here, let me spell it out for you. Love matters. How we love others is extremely important to God. Which means that we ought to be mightily troubled by these verses in 1 Corinthians 13. Because these verses very clearly, very plainly, show all that our love is not. And if you're not clear on that, if you've convinced yourself, if you lied to yourself enough to say, you know, all in all, I do a pretty good job of showing love to other people, you might want to follow along with this exercise that I'm about to demonstrate to you. Some of you have maybe heard this before, but if you look particularly at verses 4 through the first part of verse 8, go through and read those verses, but instead of the word love or any reference to the word love, replace it with your name. So it would sound something like this. Aaron is patient. Aaron is kind. Aaron does not envy. He does not boast. Aaron is not proud. Aaron is not rude. Aaron is not self-seeking. Aaron is not easily angered. Aaron keeps no record of wrongs. Aaron does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Aaron always protects. Aaron always trusts, Aaron always hopes, Aaron always perseveres, Aaron never fails. That's got a pretty cool ring to it, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Sounds awesome, doesn't it? But if we're going to go back to that part about rejoicing in truth, then I have to confess that nothing could be further than the truth of me pretending that all of those descriptions of love would be a description of me, and the same applies to you. It's so plain, it's so obvious as we look at these verses that they are an indictment against how imperfect all of our love is. But that's not even the worst of it. We would all readily admit that our love falls short. You know what's even more convicting than admitting that? It's going back to what Paul concluded chapter 12 with as he segued into this love chapter when he says, eagerly desire the greater gifts. 
So it's not so much that I have trouble confessing that my love falls short. But what might be a little more difficult for me to confess is that I lack the desire to even grow in loving others better than I do today. See, it's rather easy to just come straight forward with it. Can't we just, after all, say, all right, here's 1 Corinthians 13, the section that talks about love. Lord, I confess that's not my love. Thank you for your forgiveness and move on. But it's not so easy to admit that it's not just a, a failure of love, but the bigger issue is the lack of desire on my part. If we're going to be straightforward, if we're going to be brutally honest with each other this morning about this matter of love and Paul's command to desire eagerly to grow in our love, then don't we just have to be blunt about it? Say that quite honestly, we're not interested in that kind of change. We'd be much more comfortable just moving on, saying, My love falls short, but I'm forgiven. I'm willing to hear that message as often as I need to. But I'm not really interested in changing. Because loving others is the most difficult thing that we're called to do as Christians. You know, the, the other topics that Paul talked about, faith and hope, we're happy to have those conversations. Those are nice spiritual truths. We can talk about those topics, faith and hope. That's a little easier because that deals primarily with my relationship with God, my faith in God, my hope in God, and it's not really something that you can see or measure. That's between God and me. Love is different. Love can be seen. Love is felt. Love is experienced, and others can see it when you express it to them. And others can see when you don't. And that's the part that stings. And then to make it worse, it's not just your lack of love, but your lack of desire to grow in loving others. Who, as Paul said, eagerly desire these greater gifts. Why is that kind of love so hard? The desire to grow in my love? Because it actually means not just talking about serving others, but actually doing it. It means very real sacrifice as I put others before myself. It means inconvenience. It's so much easier for us to just say, Lord, I confess I don't love others as I should. Thank you for your forgiveness. I'll try better. But really, I don't have any intention of changing. So can't we just follow that same method, that same pattern every time we come across a love sermon, service, sermon, repeat it, and, and the same pattern, I confess, forgiven, okay, all is well. No. No, you can't. You know why you can't? Because a forgiven child of God is a changed child of God. And a changed child of God wants to change in his or her heart that desire to love others better tomorrow than I do today. That changed child of God embraces the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13 who said, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. To know that Jesus has fulfilled the law for me and, and that I'm free to do so, not only do I, I not want to pretend that that debt can ever be filled, but I don't want that debt to ever be fulfilled. I want to owe that to my fellow man. But it isn't natural for us. And so we go back to these words of the Apostle Paul in verse Corinthians 13 and there. We are reminded of so many sections of scripture that point out to us that we wouldn't even know what love was if God had not first shown love to us. And indeed embrace the fact that, that as God shows love to me today and tomorrow and the next day, that's how I know the height and the depth and the width of God's love for me in Christ Jesus when I look to the cross and to the tomb. And that's what fills me up 
with not only the ability, but the desire to get better at loving others. And so we strive to do that very thing. Now, do you think that Paul has any opinions on, on how we show that love to others? What are the best ways that we might do that? Go ahead and read the chapters that follow, chapter 13, and Paul shares his opinions very clearly. In fact, you could argue that there is no greater way to show love to others than by pointing them to the love of Christ, by sharing the word of God with others. With your brothers and sisters in Christ, to take them to the cross and the tomb to assure them that they are forgiven, children of God. With your neighbors, with those in the world, the greatest act of love you can commit and show to anybody is to point them to the love of their Savior, Jesus. That's how we know and are filled up with the love and the desire to love others more perfectly. And so we can return back to the same exercise that we did earlier. But instead of your name, instead of my name, we can replace that word love with the only name that actually fits appropriately, the name of Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. Jesus is not rude. Jesus is not self-seeking. He is not easy, easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Jesus never fails. And it is that understanding of love that drives us, that compels us to love others. Which is really what Paul captured in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 14 says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Christ's love compels us. You won't ever grow in your ability to love others if you don't return again and again to the love of Christ that compels you to do so, and equips you to do so, and energizes you to do so, and excites you to do so. Because what Jesus has done for you, the work that Jesus, your Savior, your substitute, has carried out on your behalf, does not yield stagnant hearts, but rather servant hearts. Servant hearts that long to love others the way that Jesus loves us. And then as you carry out that greatest act of love by pointing others to the word, by pointing others to the love of Jesus, that is how radical things happen in this world. That is how Jesus and his love changes the world. One soul at a time. As each and every one of us who have been transformed and changed by Jesus' love, seek to then carry and display and exercise that love to a loveless world so that they too might know what true love is. God will bless your efforts as you seek to love your neighbor by showing them the love of Jesus.